so I'm super excited to have these three up here with us. Um, you know, some powerhouses on the tech side, and, and quite frankly, Scott, I'll put words in a mouth that you probably wouldn't say yourself, but I mean, you're really a tech leader in a way. I mean, you know, you're a, you're a CEO that that sort of is willing to call the shots and, and make some technology decisions. So, um, so we had this whole plan sort of uh, leading up to today, and then we were uh, we were in the room, this room, three four hours ago, and Kelly had this quote from Union Square Hospitality, had this great quote. She referenced the mythical tech step. <laughs> and it was just so perfect, right? I mean, and we just pivoted the whole thing and decided, let's talk about the mythical tech stack, right? Let's talk about this thing. How do you even achieve greatness in 2022 <laughs> with respect to tech, right? APIs and integrations and all this stuff. So that's gonna kind of be our running theme. We're gonna kind of start and end with that and, uh, and take us uh, on a little journey. So again, feel free to jump in if there's anything. Uh, that you'd like us to expound further on. Um, but, you know, Justin, we were talking earlier and you started talking to me about how not only is there this idea of a tech stack, but then every department within the organization has its own tech stack. So there, there are multiple layers or, or almost tranches of your tech stack, right? So expand upon that a little bit for us and then maybe we'll, we'll start talking about what maybe best in class means and things like that. But, Justin, why don't you kick us off there a little bit and, and we'll just start this rodeo. Yeah, it's, it's happening, right? I mean, it's happening everywhere. You know, accounting used to have one accounting platform. That's all they ran. And now it's, it's just, it's, it's a, a crazy explosion of, of tech. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's the SaaS world that we live in, right? So, yeah, real estate has their own stack. Accounting has their own stack. There's, there's just no way to avoid it. Now you're adding in other things like IoT and like smart refrigerators and sensors and all sorts of other things going on. So it's thousands of systems potentially in a single restaurant, right? Hundreds at the very least, right? Um, so I guess the conundrum and like the riddle that we're trying to solve like today is like we have so many systems and we have to manage that. How do you manage that? So you need a system to manage the systems, which is now exponentially harder to do. Billion dollar product idea, by the way, if anyone wants to take that and run with it. The system uh, <clears throat> systems. Yeah, so you know, I think when you talk about best in class versus an all-in-one platform, it plays into that because the idea about an all-in-one is you get something that maybe doesn't do everything really great, but it does more things, so it's less to manage. I think that's a fallacy, right? Because right. one or two systems in that regard is nothing against the hundreds or thousands I just talked about. So it's, that's kind of like that, that rainbow that we're chasing that just never, you can never get to. It's a trade-off, right? It's like yeah. one throat to choke and maybe half the price. <clears throat> and that's your all-in-one system. And then you have this maybe best-in-class sort of point-to-point-to-point -to -point -to -point solution on the other end of that spectrum, right? So, so Scott, maybe you can talk to us a little bit. When the three of us were chatting last week, you and Don both mentioned best-in-class a few times. And since then, we've kind of maybe iterated on what that means. Why don't you, why don't you give us Yeah, um, you know, it's interesting. Technology is always changing. So therefore, <laughs> the tech stack is always changing, in my opinion. It's, there's not going to be a, oh, we finally got it. We're done, you know? Because the, the, cu the customer's needs change, capabilities change. And um, I think it's really important to figure out for your brand what matters, what matters to your team, to your customers and figure out sort of best in class for those things. I don't think you can get best in class for everything. It's too much work and too much integration and just a waste of time. But what matters specifically to your brand? Um, and, and what do you need to lean into to really get a great result for both your customers or your employees or whatever it may be? Um, and, and the all-in-ones, I've looked at them and they're worst in class to middle of class and all things. Uh, and, and, you know, for us, it was really sort of figuring out what are the things that we really need to do and that we need to do well. Um, and then sort of leaning in on those partnerships on the right, with the right people that we thought could really, with the right, you know, partners that could really change the game for us in some of these parts and then trying to figure out how to integrate it later, which, uh, you know, is that fun looping API craziness that we deal with. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but I do believe that that's still the best, the best route unless you can afford to have 40 of your own engineers and start building things for yourself. You know, this is the, the most affordable route to sort of access some of the best programming that's out there. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think Aaron mentioned it earlier, Aaron Novishan from Starbird. He said, um, you know, he said APIs, right? So I'm going to look to you here, Don. So he said, you know, APIs and they can integrate. What does that even mean, right? So if we're chasing a rainbow, right, <laughs> to have this mythical tech stack that sort of all works, mm -hmm. what, what does API mean? Not the definition, but what does that mean from a practical perspective when you're trying to layer in three or 13 or, or 500 technology solutions in a restaurant chain in 2022, Don? So what does that mean? To you. It, it certainly means that you're going to select vendor solutions, partner solutions, that have the ability to have an integration layer mm -hmm. that can communicate to other partners. And you've got to make sure that both of them have mature API sets that they can maintain on your behalf or on the behalf of the solution as a whole that they're offering to you. So if you think about it, um, it requires some thought and some effort. So I'll give you kind of the background of what I'm talking about. When I first got to Freebirds, their complete focus was on improving the tribe experience. We're all tribe members. That's what we call ourselves, tribe. Uh, improving the tribe experience across the entire organization and then also improving the guest experience. So what did that mean? It, for us, we focused primarily on front of house and the channels that were coming in. And we had to also look at the end-to-end -end candidate experience, as we call it. So from the minute you decide that you want to be part of Freebirds all the way to the end, um, where you get employed and you're working for us, what is your experience with the company? Mm -hmm. And so that's the challenge I was given. Um, and then I had to go and choose technologies that would meet that need. Now we are 60 locations, which means I wasn't gonna go get 40 people to program and code this from scratch. Uh, not only was that too expensive, but it wouldn't be necessary. So what's the real challenge? Is going in and evaluating partner solutions solutions that are in place that might meet our needs and that could communicate with each other. So let me give you the flavor of what I'm talking about. Uh, we went and we picked a solution that would give us uh, an applicant tracking system, a workforce management system with labor scheduling and with time and attendance, and a brand new POS platform. And schedule enforcement. Right, and between. schedule enforcement, et cetera. <clears throat> and what we said was, what's really important to us? Well, all three of those major functions were important to us based on the goals and objectives that we had set for the past year. We had to look at those solutions very closely to determine whether or not the solutions that we want could talk to each other. And so we evaluated the options based on that criteria. And the API, well, cloud native was very important to us because we felt that that would then bring in that option of having that robust API layer on top of it. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of technology details of what an API is. Enough to say that each of those tools had to be able to expose their data so that they, that platform could share that data with another platform that wasn't owned by that partner. That means we had to come up with some data elements that could be shared across all platforms. Yep. And we ended up picking three that were most important to us. Location ID, an employee ID, and our menu item ID. And so there were universal data items that could be passed through these APIs and allow us to actually get access to the data we needed as a process was going through. So we hire somebody, they get an employee ID. That employee ID passes through to workforce management and labor scheduling, same person, same identity, data is shared. That passes through to our point of sale device where we have our employees identified, but we also have um, our menu items that are there. And then they all come together when time and attendance is done. By the way, we pulled that out of POS. So we have a standalone time and attendance where clock in and clock out 
is done through iPads with facial recognition. And that data is then collected together, but all the solutions I'm talking about are actually three completely different platforms. Yeah. And they're merged together with APIs uh, because each of the solution providers that we selected actually had their data liberated and available through these API sets so that we could pass data back and forth. And I'm gonna tell you, um, because I have to, um, and because I really want to, not because I have to, but because I really want to, um, selecting a good partner is important. We selected Q Beyond as our commerce engine. I said POS, but technically, we completely rethought that piece and actually put in a commerce engine that would allow us to satisfy all ordering channels quite easily. And Q Beyond became that organization that actually was organized enough and so supportive in tying all this together. So what do APIs mean to me? <laughs> what do APIs mean to me? They mean, mean a lot, and it is the only way that we were able to pull this all together. And I know you're all thinking, you know, how the heck long did this take? Well, I've only been there 18 months, and our project started in June. We signed with Q Beyond in August, and we were fully rolled out July 12th this year to all 60 locations. So it was a full, complete scrape and replace. But I say all that to give you a little bit more of a round answer to what are APIs without that integration structure. What I'm telling you we did would not have been a possible. So I love that because you know I've been guilty before of saying who cares about an API, what's an API anyway? Like it shouldn't matter to anybody here or me or really any of these people. It's just is the right data passed in the manners that make sense between technologies, right? So I love the way that you broke it down into just come up with three or five or 13, whatever it is, but data points that are inexcusable to not be able to be shared between two or 10 different systems. And that's how you can go and evaluate, maybe not as an engineer or as a coder, the quality of the APIs of the systems that you're, that you're potentially selecting, right? Because again, I think that there's been a almost reprehensible, irresponsible use in the restaurant technology side of our ecosystem for the last 10 years about, oh yeah, I got an API, and, and if you just say you have it and you don't talk about it, then people make decisions, right? They say, oh, they got an API and so does this one, so they'll work together. It's also, beyond that, it's also the people stack too, right? Is it, are they the right partners? Go and evaluate if those companies already work together or if there are escalation paths associated with those brands, if the executives know each other and are aligned in front of you together on the same call in the same room. Absolutely. Those are almost, and in some cases, maybe more important than the cool tech between them, right? So, so thanks for that, Don. So um, now that we've talked a little bit about kind of who we are, APIs and the mythical you know, challenge of finding a tech stack that works, um, let's talk about today. Let's talk about the, I think, Justin, you brought up, never let a crisis go to waste. And Don, you and I were talking about, uh, you had a great article that you shared that sort of the newfound um, power of being the technology decision maker in a restaurant chain. So tell us a little bit about roadmap disruption and sort of what that could look, feel like. Scott, I'd love for you to drive us into this one a little bit. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, Bartaco, I think, was one of the brands that really <clears throat> leaned into the opportunity that COVID presented. Um, we didn't know it was that in the beginning, it was just chaos, but um, you know, we closed our restaurants and we were very concerned about contact. So we d decided we were gonna try and do digital ordering within the restaurant. Just full, full service restaurant, sorry. So full, yeah, service, full restaurant. service restaurant. Fast casual, we kind of said this, yeah. but fast casual, full service, and QSR, right? Yeah. So remember that from an operational perspective. So full service. So, you know, our waiters had not come back yet. They were still collecting checks from the government. And, um, <clears throat> and you know, we had our kitchen team, we had our management team. We had kept them through this sort of takeout period. Um, and I was working very closely with Olo at the time. Um, and it's funny because as a CEO, I spent very little time ever thinking about Olo um, until this happened. And then I'm like, oh my God, I need this. Um, and you know, we, we figured out delivery next level and kind of took that, you know, elevated that. And then as people were starting to come into the restaurants, 
we wanted a contactless way to order, so we tried it. And one thing that was unique about our taco, kind of like a sushi restaurant, it's all small bites, so you fill out a, a card when you order, like a paper card. And our customers have been doing that for years, and we're, we're very used to it. So once we switched to the digital model, it resonated with the customers. And, and we realized food was hitting the table fast, and they actually liked when we did it right. They liked it, even though it was clunky. It was very clunky at the time. Um, the other thing that was really interesting was we were paying all of our hourlies at the time um, $15 an hour, plus they were getting a cut of the tip pool that was coming in. We were just kind of splitting it up. Mm -hmm. This was just like a makeshift. Everybody makes the same money, and everybody gets a cut of the tips. And all of a sudden, these guys were making like $35 an hour. Dishwasher, everybody. Um, so... And my labor was lower than it had been pre-pandemic. So I'll take all these pieces together, and it was kind of like the chocolate and the peanut butter moment. <laughs> I'm like, this could work. And by the way, I don't want to give my 300 kitchen members a pay cut when this is over, because their lives have changed. Their lives have been transformed. Um, you know, they're not working two jobs now. They, they're spending time with their children. Like, they have a car instead of taking the bus. Like. Their lives were changing. Um, so I had a lot of reasons um, to say, maybe we can make this work. We've still got like, it looks like another year of pandemic at least. If we go crazy and figure this out, maybe we can come out with a model that actually functions. Um, so I had to run around to find a tech partner because Olo was not ready, or nor would they be ready by the time this was out to actually have a full system that was really focused on in-store dining. Um, so I had to find that partner, <laughs> and we had to really build an operating model around this, because it was totally different. So um, it, it, I was saying in our meeting earlier, it was kind of, this is the one time where sort of it's like wag the dog. Operations was, was chasing tech Oper instead of, instead of tech chasing operations to see what they need. We were actually trying to figure out how do we leverage this technology and create a real hospitable experience for our customers that, that they like um, and make this work. Um, so it was a very unique time, but since we've come out, um, you know, we poll our customers. We have over 60,000 impressions on a, on a poll that we sent. 86% of our customers prefer this to full service. 10% are neutral and 4% don't like it, um, which is incredible. Um, you know, we've actually seen our foot traffic grow by double digits post-pandemic. Our, our clientele's got a little bit younger, but it really resonates with them as long as we can lean into the human experience. That's the other thing that we really learned was the digital can solve the menial tasks and give us a leaner team, but we have to take advantage of that and reinvest and lean into the human side of making sure that Customers are having a great time. Um, I mean, isn't it still just full service, though? It's I mean, full service, it but you order with your phone. It's just self-led full service. Yeah. It's, it's not counter service. No. It's not QSR. It's not fast casual. That is a, I've been there many times, right? I go to yep. the one in Arlington, and it is a full service business that doesn't have a server standing in front of you. That's right. We eliminated the server class, um, and in doing so, we actually increased our salary class in that we now have a whole group that we call service leaders. Mm -hmm. um, and that's entry level management. You get management responsibilities, but you're on the floor with a zone during shifts. And you're kind of like a cross between a captain at a restaurant and the kid at the Apple store. You know, you're there to both make sure they're having fun, but make sure they're comfortable with the tech. And if they don't like the tech, give them the paper, let them fill out the card. We'll, we'll punch it in for yeah. you. But, um, uh, you know, we, we really, that position sort of was born through this. And what's really incredible is the service leader position. Now we have 130 service leaders, 150 service leaders, all salaried, uh, who used to be waiters. Yeah. And they're getting leadership development. They have 401k with a match. And they're making 65000 a year starting. And, um, you know, they're going places. They're moving up. And we're, they're getting real development. Um, so that, I think that position is going to help us scale in the future as well. So all these, all these interesting sort of benefits from just embracing the change and leaning yeah. into it. So the inmates, the inmates are running the asylum now, right? Basically, right? <laughs> First time ever that ops didn't tell tech what to do after yep. the fact and tech just had to figure it out. 
uh, <clears throat> Justin, tell us a little bit about you know that roadmap disruption again, right? So for anybody who's been asleep for the last six to 60 weeks, um, Hard House is uh, everywhere you blink, look, and you know everything else. Um, but you're starting with one, right? You have one restaurant today, and you <clears throat> were able to start with a clean sheet of paper, right? Yeah. You're starting on the backside of a pandemic. So let's talk about that responsibility, right? The ability to affect some change right out of the gate and what that looks like for an emerging brand, a single single unit chain coming out. Yeah, it's uh, we have the responsibility to stay flexible, right? And stay agile and really build a stack that's, um, you know, not plug and play is a bad word, but that's kind of the idea of it, right? Um, we want to make sure that we right size everything, and and so that is an important point that I didn't bring up earlier. We have one store; it's only been open for a month. Store number two is coming, but part of the background of the reason why I brought up my background is because I know what it looks like to do 500 stores and you know 200 stores, 20 stores, those kind of things. So um, it's important to keep that kind of in your sights, um, but it's really you know important to to you know use your expertise to let the business know what they need right at certain parts. But also really be responsive to the to the business. So I think one of the, my most important metrics at this point is user adoption, and making sure that if they're using it, that's great. It's good. If they're not using it, let's let's move on. So that's another thing that I'm trying to do is make sure that I'm not afraid to burn anything down that I built. Right. Right. I want if it's not working, we're moving on. If it's well, to that end, right? Not afraid to rip and replace along the way, but mm -hmm. to that end, right? Building a tech stack in 2022 again at one, yeah, 26 at 60. 26? Uh, 25. 25. Okay. Um, what does that look like from building the tech stack perspective, right? I mean, so for example, people come to us, come to our company, and they say, hey, I, I really want to work with you guys. And there are three or 13 locations. And it's not that I don't want to work with three or 13 location chains. It's just not part of our ideal customer profile. It's not a, a path that we go down today. And they say, but I, I really, you're the right solution for me. I'm thinking mm -hmm. about when I'm 30 and 130 and 300. So talk to me a little bit about what that agility in your tech stack looks like when you're one versus 10, 50, et cetera. Well, you know, I don't, I, I can't chase perfect all the time, right? I gotta make sure that it's acceptable at, at some level, but I can't be chasing perfect. I'm not gonna look for that, you know, that, that huge enterprise, clumsy, like cumbersome type of system that's gonna be great when I got 200 stores, you know? Right. That's what I'm not looking for right now. I don't have the team or the management or no one has the time either. The thing about the startup is that we all work as a team together, but we're also doing our own thing. Like, I mean, there's not, there's not a lot of time to manage these systems and do this stuff. It has to be something you can stand up really quickly. Um, so opposite of burn down quickly, it has to be both sides. So most everything I've put in so far um, has been stuff that can really be, you know, you gotta choose the right partner, obviously, and that really supportive but it all stands up very fast. So is it fair to say that some of it has up here, maybe the vendor doesn't know yet, but has a timestamp on it? It has an expiration date on it oh, as yeah. the brand grows. Absolutely. Right? I mean, uh, uh, you know, like we talked a little bit about contracts, right? I won't sign a contract at this point with anyone that's over two years for sure. Um, and that's a lot of the reason for that. Um, you know, I'd, I'd prefer not to have any contracts. Just, you know, you earn my business every day. But, you know, I also don't want to be replacing something every, you know, two years either. Right. So that's kind of the balance we're trying to strike, right? Right. But um, so some of the things that we're we're purchasing, you know, well, another important point about our organization is that we are a startup. We're our, a very small team, but every single one of us, I'm actually one of the youngest on the executive team, but every single one of us has massive amounts of multi-unit um, restaurant experience. So we all know what it is we're after. We're we have a, we're very picky about what we're after. Um, but I think the market in the restaurant tech space today is is uh, helpful now in that regard. I think there's, a, you know, the boom and the wagging the dog and, and, the, and the vendors are seeing the same, right? There are actually more and more startups in the space. So we have a lot more options and opportunity to us. So I like to also partner with those type of, of companies as well. The, I, I, I made a joke on LinkedIn once, like the older your software company is, the less likely I am to do business with you. <laughs> Which is fairly true, but then there's a sweet spot. You know, I do work with some startups that's like two guys in, in a garage, I guess that, that classic example. But, um, and I work with some other companies that have been around forever. I have to decide what that is. But yep. generally, those are the kind of companies that will give me the flexibility that I need. Um, and we're able to kind of do the dance together.
So Don, tell us a little bit about, you know, how do you use that? With your newfound power in the organization, right? We're here at a development show, right? We're, there are interior designers, architects, um, you know, kitchen equipment manufacturers, distributors, yet we're here on stage talking about technology, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody that's been on stage today so far has talked about technology. Um, we we're saying we now the whole industry operators are saying we're building brands around the technology so now you guys are in the driver's seat what's the responsibility of that do you take big swings or do you, or do you uh, do the opposite you say you know what it's nice to have some power I'm gonna I'm gonna do some conservative stuff how do you make those decisions uh, again 18 months in at Freebirds mm -hmm. and rip the whole stack out. So maybe, maybe, uh, maybe the answer is already there. Maybe asking the wrong person. No, no, I think, I think, it's, I think it's the right person. I, I took a swing for the fences of, yeah. on this one. Um, the, the whole scrape and replace of the front end, the front of house for uh, Freebirds was, was, um, was swinging for the fences uh, because it did require us to retrain on all those processes related to, you know, staffing and scheduling and time and attendance since um, menu management uh, is a, a little different. Their interface on the point of sale on the counter, the point of sale device on the counter changed. So we changed everything and it was overnight. Uh, basically we did training prior to that and then um, after close on the night of install, uh, you know, the close out for the night, we just go in, completely replace everything and next morning everything was bright, shiny new. So um, we were very dependent on some advanced training to go in, but that was swinging for the fences to mm -hmm. completely redo that, along with re completely redoing the infrastructure on which all of that technology stood. So for example, our, the network equipment in each of our restaurant locations, we had to look closely at that. We had to standardize, because it really wasn't standard across each location. Uh, we had to go in and do a lot of work related to network security. All part of the stack now, this is swinging for the fences. Um, we also put in monitor, monitoring technology, which wasn't there before, so we're getting alert monitoring the way we should know, um, with uh, exceptions being called out. So we did all of that. We configured the whole network profile, network equipment profile that night as well. We also put in... Um, a splash page on front of our free Wi-Fi. So when I got there at first last year, uh, every one of our Freebirds location offered free Wi-Fi to anyone without a password. So we actually provided data services to our neighboring businesses. <laughs> I'm dead serious. We caught uh, one location streaming for two days and to, for their customers on our Wi-Fi. So, it, I mean, you, it's not just the end user software that you're looking at. It has to be the entire technology stack that you're looking at if you're going for a complete transformation. Uh, the other part of that was we had, again, influence, right? We had to go look at our menu and the way it was structured. We happened to be on an NCR platform and the PLU structure, I think, somebody stopped counting at 10.2 million because they'd been on NCR for eight years and it was a holy mess. So we mm. just completely pulled back and started with one question. What do we sell? And then we began from there. And so we completely restructured the data that represented what we sold at our restaurants and our online channels and restructured that data uh, and it was so much easier to manage and maintain on a more current technology platform, such as QBeyond. Uh, for us, we were able to much more effectively do that. And what do I mean by that? I had my POS engineer last year on the NCR platform spending 110 hours to make basic changes with our menu items and our pricing. 110 hours just to try to get it all right for all our order channels. With our new platform, he is spending less than 30 hours end to end if you were changing all your menu pricing and, all, and adjusting menu items. And that's end to end with testing installed. So that's the significant reduction in time that you can get with more modern platforms. Um, so yes, yeah, swinging for the fences 
means, especially if you have a multi-unit uh, brand like we do, is going in and making sure that that technology in your stack is more current, it's more manageable, more efficient, and it certainly helps in productivity all the way through the organization, not just at the restaurant, which, uh, and by the way, that one, we gained so much benefit from redoing our point of sale interface. Um, we used to spend 80 people hours to train a cashier, a brand new cashier. Um, now it's less than 60 minutes. I mean, that's the difference that it can make when you really look at your tech set closely and take advantage of some of the advances with the technology that have occurred in the last three to four years. Swinging for the fences is the right thing to do right now because of the sheer amount of money that has been put into restaurant technologies in the last three years. Interesting. So, so if I can paraphrase, you walked in, you kicked everything out, but before you did it, you went, you found things that could communicate with each other, that could execute well against the important data set that mattered to you and across the different segments of your business, FP&A, you know, ops, uh, labor, et cetera, right across the board training. You, you laid the framework to be able to get to where you then, and help us out here one last bit, but uh, you, you rolled 60 stores out, but after those first three or five or seven stores that, that you sort of proved the model out against a couple different operational models, I think you did 55 or something in a month or? Yes, six, that's great. Yeah, right. In five so, weeks. Yeah. And the key is planning, right? Exactly. Planning up, taking the time to know what you want, making sure you're spending the time and effort to lay the groundwork for the actual configuration of what you're trying to accomplish or the development. Um, and then making sure you have a plan. You've got change management you have to consider for all entities in your organization. How is it gonna impact them? What's in it for them? Making sure that they're on board with what you're trying to accomplish. And then making sure you have a robust plan to go out. If you have all of that and you spend a few weeks in pilot making sure all your solution providers are aligned and that you are actually seeing the outcomes that you had planned, then you're ready to go. You have the right partners. Uh, it really does flow quite easily. And we did not lose one hour of operation in any of our locations. We were up and running by opening time for us. So it's very important. Planning is very important in this whole process and making sure on, on, the, back, uh, on the front end and making sure you, you as a brand know what you want on the front end. I'm here to tell you, and honestly, I'm sure nobody will disagree with me, a vendor cannot tell you what is good for your business. A vendor cannot and should not tell you what is good for your business. As a business, you need to know what it is you want to accomplish and partner with your solution provider, your vendor, to get you to where you want to be. So you've got to spend the time to know what you need. That's two of the words that have rarely been uttered. <laughs> um, Scott, tell us a little bit, bring it kind of full circle again back to being a development-based conference, right? So. Um, the, the uh, evolution of the tech stack today, right? The op stack, uh, how has that, and how is that, and how has that, again, being a CEO, not just a CTO, how's that dictating, changing the way that you're, that you're looking at your store from a layout perspective, from a tomorrow's model, right? The Bar Taco 2.0, what's the 3.0, and ha again, how tech, from infrastructure <coughs> to, to, to commerce, POS yep. at all, et cetera, kitchen, what's that looking like for you? Um, you know, we've, we already had takeout areas, so thank goodness that we had already built those in. Um, but we are developing those a little more with cubbies, so we have space for orders. Um, you know, one of the things that we do, which is sort of maniacal, but we put timers on every bag. And once uh, they've sat for 20 minutes, we, re we re remake it and we charge Uber, DoorDash, whoever didn't show up. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we're, we're using, that's, old school technology, it's a timer with a clip, but it works fine. Um, <laughs> we are getting ready for sort of modernizing our kitchens. Um, we are working on digitizing our kitchens, essentially. So we want KDS. Uh, we're trying to build the right one. One of the challenges being a full service restaurant is the now omni-channel ordering third party and takeout are disruptive to the business within our restaurant. But we want the incremental sales, obviously. So, um, you know, 
there, I have yet to see a great algorithm out there that is throttling it correctly, uh, but we do believe once KDS is set up and you can actually look at the orders um, digitally, then they can start filling in and accepting orders when there's space and not when we're overrun. And right now the manager turns it like a dial and he usually turns it off and then forgets to turn it off. Right. Um, so, so you know, that's a great opportunity. Um, also, we're working sort of in the world of we have so much data in our kitchen from how much food we sell to how much we make and creating predictive prep based on sales forecasting and things so that we can actually print out a prep list that's going to tell the team what to make based on need, sort of yeah. a Kaizen, you know, in out sort of philosophy. Um, so all of that is sort of the back of the house is catching up now is the goal, trying to get them caught up. Um, and, you know, with the front of the house, we, we just sort of went light years in the last 18 months. Two years and Two. six months, you said, yeah. right? I think it's more than that. But. Yeah, and, and I'll say this, that, you know, what, what you guys were talking about was good advice. And from my CEO perspective on this, when I'm looking for partners, um, tech partners, and what I hold my team accountable for are some simple rules. Um, one of them is that they can't control my processing. I will not have a technology card, partner that, that, that is yeah. locked in with a process. Credit card, yeah. Right. Credit card processing, yes. Um, that sticks me in the mud. Um, you know, if they crank the rate up, what am I going to do? The other one is data. Own your data. Bring it in-house. Um, don't rely on your third-party vendors to hold your data. Um, I want my data so I have it. Um, and then the other one is really getting to know the ownership and the leadership within the partners that you talked about, not the salespeople, because they'll tell you whatever you want to hear. Right. But it's not going to work. Um, but get honest answers and, and feel comfortable working with those people. You know, the roadmap, they have a roadmap too. Um, and it's important that you can actually understand that roadmap a little bit. Because the one thing I know is things are going to change and we're going to evolve and things are going to go quick and the best partners are going to evolve with you. Um, other ones are stuck in the mud, they're too big, and they have to figure out what Applebee's wants, not what I want. Um, right. So you have to have those right partnerships. Right. You know, one of the things that I always like to coach folks on just to think about is, you know, look where that vendor, software developer, whatever it is, look where they derive their revenue from, and that will tell you what they care about. Yep. And that's something not to forget. <laughs> look at what that technology provider provides and look at where they get their revenue from, and that is what they are focusing on. They're focusing on driving more of that revenue from that part of the stack. So to your point, whether it's payments or the, the roadmap or whatever that is, ask that question, right? Yeah. That's, it's a good one to ask. There has to be alignment, you know? There has to be alignment, yeah. right? Um, so, so Justin, um, again, infrastructure, kitchen. Scott mentioned earlier that he's got two different ISPs and a 5G failover. First person I know with a 5G failover in the restaurant, awesome. True. Not just 4G, but 5, we're there. Um, T-Mobile, they just rocked it recently. There it is, it works. I love that. Um, but uh, tell us a little bit, Justin, about, again, um, you know, what your progress has looked like uh, in Hard House today as you're moving forward from those KDS, POS kiosk, off-prem, DSPs, et cetera. Okay, um, so yeah, I'll back up a little bit, because yeah. I, I think I look at being the tech leader, I want to answer that question also because it kind of all ties in together. Mm -hmm. And I look at it from a leadership standpoint um, because this is happening to all the tech guys in all the restaurants where we used to be like just a cost center, we worked for the CFO and we just kind of had to keep the lights on kind of a thing. And now we're- Mushrooms, keep them in the Yeah, mushrooms, whatever. So now we're, we're more uh, visible, we're more active, like technology is a more uh, requirement or wh whatever we've been talking about here about how technology is influencing the industry and those leaders have to step up as well. So one of the things that I'm trying to do is really move myself like really into the center of the business and try and be involved and touch as much as possible. Easier in a startup, right, or a smaller kind of, kind of group. But you have to have that mentality, I think, because then when you're starting to talk about the store layouts, right, so there's things I'm involved in now that, uh, that, you know, because everything's a, this digital journey, right? The guest journey, and it touches all these different places. So it's not just ordering, right? That was to your point about the table service, right? It's, it's still table service. You just took the ordering and made it digital. Right. 
But what retail did was they call it BOPIS, right? It's buy online, pick up in store, right? Which is a much more comprehensive term of what's happening, right? Yes, you ordered and yes, but then there's this journey to from online to in store. So when you're responsible for that kind of guest experience, then so many things come into play that are physical and in the store. Um, there's digital signage that I'm much more involved with now, and wayfinding and things like that. Um, so you know when you're a tech leader in the restaurant space at this point, you should be touching everything because your tech is touching everything. Right? So that, that's something I just really have to you know, focus on but, you know, and, and make sure that everyone's very you know, comfortable with it as we go. But um, you know, the, the, the guests are being trained by retail every day. Right? They go to Target, they go to Nordstrom, and we're now seeing what retail did. So retail used to put, I don't know if anyone, I'll date myself, but when you ordered something in a catalog, you had to go to the third floor of the J.C. Penney in the back by the gift wrap station. By the loading dock, basically. Yeah, the, well, inside, was, the inside of the loading dock. It was, it was like where, where the corporate office was, the executive offices were, and all this. That's where you picked up your catalog orders, and then you started seeing it slowly move down. And then there's times when it was like, like moved on the first floor. And now, if you go into a Nordstrom, it's like, boom, there's shelves, product. They brought it all down there. They're meeting you. They're, they're really embracing that. And for the restaurants, we have that same customer. We have that same journey. Um, it's a lot more complicated than just putting up shelves. It seems to be, uh, you know, some, some brands have done that, just put up shelves. <laughs> and to, from a facility standpoint, we need a place to put these bags. But there's so much more to that journey. Um, so we're really focused on, on developing that journey. Um, and that involves all part of, you know, marketing, um, executive, every, every part of the business is trying to make sure that journey is well tended for. Yeah, well yeah. taken care of. And I'd like to add to that, you know, this is this uh, particular forum that we're at here at Restaurant Spaces used to focus primarily on design construction, you know, the interiors mm -hmm. of four walls. It's magnificent to see it evolving um, and into the technology discussion and how that impacts it. But um, I would have to 100% agree with uh, Justin at this point, because even I am now very much aligned with our design and construction group. Why? Well, if you think about it, from the point in time that we identify a location, uh, start with real estate for that matter, um, I need to go take and evaluate that location to see if I can actually have and get network service, reliable network service to that physical location and at affordable price so that somebody's going to show up and say, hey, yeah, you can yeah. get it, but here, here's a $25,000 bill for construction to actually get yeah. you what you want, right? So we need to know from that point with the real estate. estate yeah, I have it built into leases at, right, exactly. very early And on. building it yeah. into the lease. You do the analysis to make sure that we know what we need for that location. And being the technology team being aligned with that site identification process and the lease process, we put our language into our leases now. And then also with the design team. And why the design team? Oh, right. Well, if you take a look at some of the technologies that we're introducing into Fast Casual, so um, we haven't talked about some of this, but um, kitchen display, kitchen management systems with KDSs, not every, look, every brand has had that, but it's very much important for us to have that now and going forward in the future. Um, so especially with our off-site services, right, you've got a back line that maybe you're making food on. Well, you need to have the tech, not those orders coming in straight to that back line, not to the POS, so you interrupt the four-wall service, right? You need that coming into something in the back room. Well, where do you put that tech? It requires a screen, it requires a bump bar, it requires a design that will function and not interrupt the operation. For those of you who have KDS and always have with full service or whatever, you, you understand that, but for the fast casual or quick serve restaurants that might never not have had that in the past, you know, that's something new. So you have to make sure those spaces are designed properly. We're going through a major redesign of our back of house, so now we're tech is involved with those conversations. We've just changed the complete POS on the counter. Well, the current design of the counter doesn't lend well to this beautiful sleek machine we now have at the end. We've got, it just doesn't look right. So we have to redesign that. We're bringing in new payment methods. So right now, 
We've got um, the regular EMV reader, or pin pad, or depending on your background. Um, that's a nice sleek unit that we're using now. Nowhere for it. We're looking at Amazon One. You guys know Palm Payment from Amazon One. Uh, the little stand, that has to go somewhere so you can just wave your hand over the palm payment and you leave because it's all done right there. We're doing scan technologies for um, the redemption of loyalty. Well, we need a scanner. Uh, where do you put that? Uh, so, I mean, there are all these things. We're looking at even um, the just walked out technology from Amazon overlooking our make line so that we don't have to go through the process of having the tribe member having to remember what they put in the burrito before they folded it, that they can actually go and start scooping and you know, computer vision will take care of it. All of those things, though, require technologies to be brought into the space. So you have to work with the design team to figure out what wiring goes where, where you're going to mount certain things, and et cetera. So there's a lot. Uh, a lot of influence that technology is going to have on the future. Um, and, and so you have to be a part of the decision-making team all the way through implementation. Yeah, voice gets all the recognition these days, but I, I do think that in QSR and fast casual, it's computer vision. That's really I the agree. big leap forward. Well, it's all about data. Year two, three, five. It's all, yeah. So it's great that you put the KDS in so they can see the orders, but really the KDS, so we had this discussion, and this goes back to your Early, how do you build for a startup? Uh, the CEO at the time said, well, just use printers. I'm like, why, why not just use printers? You're getting it into the kitchen, right? But no, I got, you have to have that data. Well, I have to think of times. I got to have that data. I actually put in an extra yep. screen just to get more data because we're tracking that journey through the That's kitchen right. because I now have to time the guest to the right time. I need to know how many orders I can go through my kitchen. Once. You can't operate a, a restaurant in today's world without having that data. Right. You can't do that. Yeah, you can stick your finger up and yeah, see I mean, which way the wind try. <laughs> you can try. Yeah, and then you have flyby, which you'd heard about today. Mark and Scott were talking about that. That's they were right. talking about, Ape, uh, I think they're working with Apex, mm -hmm. but Apex, Panasonic, they're a handful of smart smart cubbies, right, that mm -hmm. are coming out. And, That's right. Um, yeah, so when you're designing, I mean, again, 60, you went and ripped the whole tech out and put a whole new tech stack, and now you have a Freebirds 2.0 layout that's, that's coming out. That's right. You, you changed both layout, tech infrastructure, and guest engagement yep. two years ago, almost overnight. And you have the luxury, frankly, of starting with one and being able to know in today's world that you know you need two areas for the guest, one on the counter and one for the off-prem guests that are coming in that want to spend as little time as humanly possible in there getting the right order and getting out the door back to their car, whether that's a DSP driver or a customer that doesn't want to talk to anybody, right? There are plenty of those. Um, so the last thing here, we've got three minutes left, last thing. Mm -hmm. Justin, we're going to start with you. Uh -oh. Uh oh. How did you architect the tech stack to be able to deliver for the next 18 months? Well, kind of some of the things I talked about before, like I right size my vendors. That's that's number one. We've all been kind of talking about that. Uh, I right size my my contracts. You know, make sure that those are like I said, two years. So not far off from 18 months, right? 18 to 24 is about as far as I can think in advance. Um, and you know that's one of the kind of the conundrums of the roadmap. It's like we used to five-year roadmaps, and what the, what's happening in five years? How many black swan events are we going to have in, in the next five years? Right. We don't really know. So uh, the 18 months is a good target. 18 to 24. Um, you, you know, I want I want my vendors to earn my business on on the regular. You know, it's like I talked about, um, and everything I do just supports that digital guest experience because that's the world we're in. Right? As soon as it flipped past 50 percent. Which uh, you know the crisis happened, uh, but that it's never going back, right? So, uh, you know, digital orders skyrocketed during COVID, and they're not going down. It's just the uh, the rest of it's coming back. The digital stays and stays strong, and that's just the business we're in now. Um, I think Aaron was was saying that there's a split. I think that's a, it's an important point. The, the split in the industry is ultra convenient to ultra high touch. And so we have to be on that ultra convenient side, that ultra convenient side, being, being able to manage these expectations. So really everything I do is framed around that. Thank you. Scott? Um, for me, you know, we did Bartaco 2.0 during the pandemic. We're working on Bartaco 3.0 right now is what we're calling it. But that's more of a modernization of the kitchen and bringing them into the digital side because um, we recognize the importance of KDS and 
all of that. Um, but, you know, I think it's really important to understand in the last three years, my 75-year-old father now knows how to order food on his phone, uh, which he would have never done. But COVID forced people into the digital world. It forced them into ordering. And it, it, and it just accelerated everything. Um, and, you know, it's, it's continuing to move that quickly. So it's really hard to get past 18 months. Yeah. It's really hard to know. Um, and that's why I think it's just important to be really nimble and, be, and listen to your customers and spend a lot of time going through the customer journey yourself and, and really making sure that it resonates. Um, we have a, I hired a director of digital experience. That's a full-time, well-paid job, six-figure job that ugh, I would have never had in the restaurant business, you know, mm -hmm. director of digital experience. But that, all she does is think about the digital experience for the customer and for the employees, because that matters too. As an employment brand, you have to be digitally forward just as much to keep your staff. Um, so, you know, it's nimble. Yeah. Be nimble and listen. Yeah. Thank you. Nim and aligned. Right? Yeah. Ellen? Yeah. All of what they just said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll go more on the technology side of it from a tech stack perspective. Um, pretty much in summary what I had mentioned before. A solid foundation, which is your infrastructure, which we have cleaned up and we now have managed. Um, so we, we actually uh, have tools to manage it remotely and keep us safe. Uh, the next layer, um, we actually, as I said, clearly defined what our data layers are and what our data requirements were. So we've got technologies there. We use Domo for BI. So really solid uh, data layer in all of this. And then we selected uh, partners that are cloud native, API first, if at all possible, where they're leveraging microservices to make sure we're flexible and that we have um, a, a layer where we're not tied into anybody's technology over transaction-based type uh, agreements, um, we can, we, we've put together a structure that allows us to swap out components based on our need and what's important to us. It's never going to be the end. There is no such thing as the end. Uh, technology is here to stay and we'll see constant evolution in this process from here on out. Restaurants took a while to jump on this digital transformation bandwagon. Um, it's been like this for a lot of industries prior to this. You will see it the same thing going forward. Thanks, Tom. And thanks to each of you for, for spending the last hour with us. Uh, and really, thank you so much for our scheme. To, uh, yeah, thank you, guys. This is an excellent discussion. Thank you, Don, Scott, Justin, and Nico. Excellent job moderating.